for the uh, for the interest of time. Um, welcome everyone um, to um, the first session on our panel uh, discussing cities, urbanization, and the politics of urban infrastructure systems. Um, so on behalf of uh, the co-conveners, uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Friend from the Department of Environment and Geography at University of York, um, Dr. Jonathan Enther at the Stockholm Environment Institute also at York, and myself also um, from SCI at York. Welcome to the first session. Um, so it's a kind of unorthodox format as you'll probably be aware from the various emails uh, DSA have been sending us. Um, so they've stressed, um, hopefully everyone's seen the presentations and the materials that have been circulating online. Um, DSA has stressed that we keep our quote unquote presentations to under um, five minutes, so no more than five, certainly, but it's aimed for two to three brief outline of what your papers are about, and then we'll open, um, we'll open it up into kind of a, a discussion of each of the each of the papers. So we have four for this session. So if we can find our, our time to maybe 10 minutes for each, we should hopefully get through everything. Um, so if it's okay, we'll just follow the running order that we have outlined online and we'll start um, uh, with the first uh, set of, of uh, presenters. Um, so uh, please uh, welcome uh, Katrine Hoffer, Michael Wickey and David Kaufman who will talk about uh, the people's perspective of public participation in infrastructure and housing provision in South Africa, evidence from the factorial uh, survey experiment. So please uh, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, well, it's actually just me presenting. Uh, so my co-authors unfortunately cannot be here today. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to keep it very brief. Um, my research looks at public participation in the context of South Africa. And um, um, my particular interest is looking at the people's perspective on state-led participatory processes in the context, context of infrastructure and housing provision. And so the paper that I well, present today or that you hopefully seen um, in the video is um, based on a survey experiment in, in, uh, in a settled residential um, area in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, and the idea there was to, on the one hand, um, see whether people generally support these forms of, of public participation in infrastructure and housing provision, but then on the other hand, to also see what kind or how a process needs to be designed for people to support them. So um, what are the different kind of design features um, that, that make people support public, part uh, public participation more? And what we can see from this experiment is that people generally support participatory processes more that are more inclusive. Um, so meaning that they are open to all residents and not just a selection of few people being involved and in representing the community. And also they prefer participatory processes that um, invite people over a longer period of time to discuss their, their, um, their thoughts and their priorities and needs rather than just providing input and then letting the government wor uh, work with us and come back with a solution. Um, and then what we can also see is that there are differences um, in regards to um, the, the kind of type of infrastructure that people see important um, when it comes to public participation. And here, our survey design, we um, included in our sample people who live in state-supported housing and people who live in, um, in, in non-supported housing. Um, and, and this is in, in the context mainly in the form of backyard dwellings, which is kind of an informal way of inhabiting um, um, backyards of formal housing. And um, here we can see actually that there are differences in how people want to be involved with the government um, when it comes to infrastructure and housing provision. And we can see differences in the, in, in the sense of whether they want to be involved through longer term plans or specific projects. And we can also see differences in the type of infrastructure um, that they want to be involved in. And here actually we found some quite surprising results. Um, because we were expected that people who live in informal houses would be more willing to engage in processes that are linked to housing, but actually what we see is the opposite. So people living in state-supported housing, they want to participate in processes that are linked to houses, whereas the others, they rather want to participate in other or processes that are linked to other types of infrastructure. And so this is where we are right now. Um, and so the plan is to um, now in a second step also conduct um, focus group interviews um, 
um, or focus group discussions um, to actually kind of um, contextualize these findings a bit better and to understand a bit more why this is the case and why um, yeah, we can see these differences. Um, yeah, so I think I'm going to stop there and yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Katrine. Um, thank you for keeping it nice and short and sweet as well. <laughs> so we have plenty of time for the Q&A. Um, I have a few questions, but I'm, I'm happy to kind of open it up to anyone else who might want to um, direct some questions to Katrine on, on our paper and presentation. Any, any takers? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to ask, um, yeah, thanks for that, Katrin. Um, what were the biggest, what was the, the big challenges you think facing um, these issues from your, your research? What did people re report as being the, the most important factors? Um, should I answer right away or are we gonna collect some questions and then I'll come? It's um, up to you. Would you prefer to have a, a kind of a set of questions? We can go either way. If there are any other questions. Both uh, is fine with me. <laughs> are, are there any kind of immediate questions that people would like to add? Um, perhaps we can take a few and then, sure. um, then you can respond. Hi, Bobby. Hello, everyone. Hi, Anisha, do you have a question? Yes, I have, because I this was related to participation, which we were also seeing in Tulikil. So I was relating to, I, I, hello, Catherine. I had seen your video presentation and found it very interesting. Uh, we also have a similar case of, part, uh, in terms of cases are different, but the participation issue is also in our site. I am from Nepal. And I was wanting to understand, because you also mentioned about there is a, a willingness to participate in some infrastructure, whereas not in others. So what were the factors that were determining willingness to participate in some and and, and not in some others. So this was very interesting. And what form of participation was actually happening? For example, was it a rhetoric participation in terms of contribution in some, um, in terms of some cast, which we see in, in our sites, or what was the participation that was actually happening? And were they able to really influence the decision? Thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, I'll... I'll jump in with perhaps one of my own. Anyone else? Um, if not, um, kind of maybe two questions if I can. <laughs> Be cheeky. Um, I liked uh, your mention of infrastructural citizenship or your reference to infrastructural citizenship in your um, uh, in the PDF. I was wondering if you can maybe elaborate how you intend to use that concept um, in the paper. And the other uh, question I would have is about uh, design features. So I was quite interesting uh, interested to kind of hear a little bit more about what characteristics of design um, you've, your research has kind of uh, discovered that is perhaps maybe conducive to um, greater participation? Thanks. Are there anyone, is there anyone else? Or should we just, uh, is three enough for now? Actually. Sure, perhaps. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. happy to respond to those. <laughs> okay. And I mean, if something else comes up, uh, um, we can take let's, it. Let's, let's leave you with those then for now, thanks. Okay. Right. Well, I mean, thank you very much for these questions. Um, I think I'm just going to take them in order. So um, first question, what was the challenges or what pe people report as being the biggest challenges in, in the area? Um, I mean, because it was a survey um, and we had a sample size of 500 people, it was um, the survey contained mostly closed questions. So it wasn't an open question that was asked to them. Uh, we did ask them about um, how, um, what kind of access they have to different types of infrastructures and how satisfied they are with these um, types of infrastructure. So there is a way to kind of cross-reference that to see whether people who think housing is the biggest problem are they more willing to participate in housing or not. Um, again, what we actually see is that this is not, there is not really um, a link there that it's, um, kind of the bigger the need, the more willing they are participate in, in this area, but actually kind of the other way around. And so how we're interpreting this right now is to kind of say there, if there might be kind of a, a, let's say threshold that needs to be met for people to then be willing to actually 
go beyond that and to work with the government in terms of um, thinking about how the provision should look like. And if it's beyond that threshold, where it's really just a basic need that people need to have covered, they rather expect the, the government to deliver it than actually being willing to work with the government to get this right fulfilled. Um, but this, as I said, that's something that we actually would like to discuss um, in the focus group discussions, because I think that's one of the limitations of doing survey research and quantitative research in general, because we don't really get to the bottom of this why question. And and I mean, kind of also linked to what is are the biggest challenges. That's also something that we would like to include in the in the focus group discussion, because I think it's important to also ask that as an open question, not just kind of um, yeah pre-give the categories that they can choose as 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 an issue. Um, Linked to the second um, or coming to the second question about what kind of participation and what types of infrastructure we had included um, or, or this was about, um, it's important to say that this was an experiment. So it, it's, it doesn't ask people about real participatory processes, but actually it asks them about hypothetical scenarios. And so um, in the survey, we had different hypothetical processes. Um, and then um, people could rate these processes. And so within these processes, we had different combinations of different, what's called attribute. Um, and so when it comes, for example, for, to infrastructure, we had either a participatory process was about water, it was about roads, or it was about housing. Um, but then because of the other attributes, there were, um, in total kind of 24 different um, combinations of all these different attributes. So um, we had 24 different stories that people rate and because um, of the sample size, we could actually, um, we have enough statistical power to, to assess all of these. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's hypothetical and it's not a real case scenario. So, uh, and having said that, that's also one of the maybe limitations of this kind of research because we don't know how people would actually react in a real case scenario. Um, it is, a hypothetical case that we introduced them to. Um, and then to Bobby's questions, I mean, that links to the design features. Um, and so, I mean, there are, there is a great variety of different participatory processes. And what we've done is to kind of look at what are the dimensions in which they differ. And so we came up with four different dimensions that seem to be important when it comes to par participatory processes. And so, well, we, we then defined that as being the who is involved in participation, um, then the what, like what is it all about, <laughs> why is it called for, and the fourth one is how. And um, because of, of the specific uh, methodology we were using and because we were, um, we already knew that we have to conduct these um the survey in a face-to-face -face manner and it can't be too complicated, we decided to then to, for each of these dimensions to only have kind of two characteristics. Um, so um, in, in, a, in a context where we could do this online or where it, where it would be written and people would see it in front of them, it could be much more complex, but we had to kind of simplify the design of our survey experiment. Um, and so, yeah, the design feature actually these four dimensions with each then um, a set of characteristics um, linked to them. And, and maybe if, if I still have time um, to the uh, infrastructural citizenship uh, concept. Um, so that's um, something that, or I mean, the con this concept kind of inspired the way we set up this experiment because we were not only interested in looking at how, um, whether people generally support uh, participation, but we were actually also interested in seeing um, whether there are different um, kind of preferences depending on what what the existing relationship with the state is. And, and in a context like South Africa, it's a very complex um, setting and the, the relationship to the state is very important or is also has changed over time and infrastructure always played a crucial role in that. And so we decided to kind of look into this by, by taking this infrastructural citizenship lens and then to divide our sample into two groups. And, and this is where the state supported housing and, and the backyard dwellings come in because we assume that actually the way people live and the way whether people receive support from the state in the past or not defines their relationship um, or is, is, is a strong indicator of people's relationship with the state. And 
maybe also their willingness to engage with the state. And so, so this is where the concept comes in. And as I said before, we, we're planning with the focus group discussions to kind of follow up on this as well and to see, is that really the case? Do people um, kind of unpack this relationship a bit further to see, um, is, is that really a marker of, of, or an indicator of, of what the relationship with the state is like? That's really excellent. Thank you. Um, that last point around the relationship with the state is particularly fascinating for some of the work um, we've been doing here at York. So it'd be it'd be great to see how that research progresses going forward. Thanks again. Um, so just for the interest of time, I best uh, I best move us on. Um, so uh, please uh, welcome the next set of presenters: uh, Lee Barron from Northumbria University, Jai Yi Ying also from Northumbria, and Cheng uh, Shen Feng Quin also from Northumbria who will be talking about uh, a collective participation, building the long-term sustainability through the grassroots approach. Um, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, uh, I'm glad to see Ajayi is here. Uh, sadly, we seem to have lost um, Professor Sheng Feng along the way. Um, so I don't know if Jai uh, wants to start things off uh, given the, um, the order of our paper. Are you here, uh, Jaya? Hi, Lee. Uh, hi. Uh, should we just play the recording of our... Uh, uh, no, I think we just talk it through. Uh, everyone's seen that. So we'll just give, I, a, I let's just give a, a brief overview of our, our, our splendid project. I think I will... <laughs> do you mind just take it over? Because I don't have that um, the copy of my paper on our desktop. Okay, no problem. I can, I'm happy to do that. And you can just add in anything that you think I've missed. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay, awesome. Um, well, great to be here. Um, and this is a, a spectacularly um, well organized uh, online conference. It's the scope of it. Um, <laughs> epic. Uh, it's a, so well done for pulling together uh, such a, an amazing um, array of people uh, and a really great opening plenary. Okay, so um, I'll research is based on um, working with the British Academy, just to really look at engagement with net zero uh, in, in a, a kind of very focused way. So we we kind of looked at really what does net zero mean, um, given the government's drive towards 2030 and 2050 for a completely carbon neutral um, British society and kind of energy neutrality. And we wanted to look at how local communities engage with that. So looking at the responses from 2019 to the government's policy, many have argued that without local community engagement, it really cannot work. This can't simply be a governmental top-down state endorsed process. So we really wanted to look in a very, um, very focused location, the way in which communities can engage, come together, and how could a grassroots collective response and engagement with net zero be created, formed. So in one of the issues in looking at literature, I became really interested in the increasing um, role that cultural organizations are playing in sustainability development. Um, so museums, cultural spaces, and we chose in a, a northeastern um, coastal town called South Shields in the northeast of England. And we also did a, a similar um, process in Newcastle as well. So we juxtaposed a major city with a, a post-industrial town. So it was once governed by coal mining, um, steel making, shipbuilding. Uh, now it isn't. We kind of looked at a, a, what is a, a kind of library stroke cultural center. And so we wanted to kind of just really see what local communities thought of net zero and sustainable development and really what that meant to and kind of to really test out this idea that how will communities come together so we had a, it was a very micro um focused research so we used elements of surveys we had um uh, qr codes that people could uh, access and leave comments online in our systems um and we also used co-creation workshops um, basically because a co-creation workshop by its nature is dubbed to be citizen-centric, creative, and really allows people to either at length or very quickly and creatively express their ideas and thoughts. 
Um, so initially we went by the book to have a really extended you know, hour plus co-creation workshop, but that didn't really work because nobody came. Um, but we finally, you know, we managed to get people into the room and talk to them. And then we kind of really went with the pop-up approach. And from my interviews with um, carbon reduction officers who'd used this approach, it worked really well. So we got a lot of findings, a lot of immediate responses to the concept of net zero and sustainable development. And I think what was really interesting is really the concept of net zero is quite vague and abstract. Um, so whilst it's become the great buzzword and the policy driving force, many people really couldn't define it in detail. Um, as part of our research, we'd created a banner which did define it. And once they read that, they said, oh yeah, of course, that's what it means. Um, but it was interesting to find out really that the concept of net zero is something which needs much clearer articulation from a state perspective. Sustainable development, not a problem. People could really understand that, get to grips with that, and kind of recognize that indeed without community engagement, this really isn't going to work. So what we wanted to do is just really find out from a bottom up approach, what matters to a local community. So when we're thinking about sustainable development, net zero development at a state level, at a macro level, what would that mean for a, a, a fairly small historically um, industrial coastal town? And we, again, we found things such as recycling was crucial, but more clarity with that. Um, the, we saw, we found issues of, of transformations in built environment, I think which tapped into some questions raised um, with William's paper um, in, the, in the plenary session. The need to kind of really start thinking about removing cars uh, and creating much more centralized walkable spaces. The in greater investment in green space and more importantly, the defense of existing green spaces and how that comes into balance with the need for increased housing. And these were interesting issues. Um, again, a, a, a larger primacy of alternative energy sources, such as wind power. And also the, the, the increased use of public spaces was seen as a really important issue. Sorry, Lee, can, um, can I, apologies, but can I get you to wrap up the, the point? Yeah, um, absolutely. So we, have, uh, so we have enough time for the Q&A. Yeah, so. And what we found then in interviewing um, local authority and carbon reduction officers and managers, was a, a real recognition that, um, yeah, community and outreach is crucial uh, and that sustainability net zero can't be done simply as a, as a top-down force. Um, and cultural spaces have a role to play, but they're not the only issue. So we're looking really at the next level of how we kind of widen that out to build a much uh, more extensive dynamic network. Thank, th thanks very much, Dan. Sorry for um for coming. No, no problem. It get you get carried away when you. We're just uh, it's quite tight for times. Um, so uh, are there any questions uh, that we can pose for the perhaps um, over video? But also, if anything comes up, please uh, please use the chat function. Um, I would I would just throw one out to you, Lee, um, if I can. Um, it's just about uh, the kind of the co-creation workshops. Um, that your research has been kind of using and um, I think that's a really kind of interesting angle right to explore kind of like uh, the cultural dynamics involved in, in thinking about sustainability and the, kind of the uptake of, of different concepts or how different concepts might be understood differently in different communities. So I was just wondering what are some of the challenges involved in translating perhaps uh, a concept around you know sustainability um, in in kind of these different contexts and what uh, perhaps more pragmatically have you done within the workshops to help kind of convey that information to local communities? Um, at a practical level in moving to the pop-up style, um, we kind of, we literally created a banner which defined the concepts. So uh, we kind of drew on our literature research to pull out what we thought were the main issues and use that as a probe um, so that we didn't imply this is the be all and end all, but what we did was to pull together a definition that respondents could agree with, or in some cases not, which was interesting. Um, and also again, to, to look at this notion of, of, of what net zero means or doesn't. And I think the most important thing is for many people, it didn't mean anything. 
it's just a term, a concept. It's just become synonymous. Uh, and again, as some researchers have argued, even if you deal with net zero, that's just one faction of, of sustainable development. So it was useful to use a visual cue to kind of really get people engaged with that process um, and, and really help to people have different opinions from cynicism. Um, you know, to, I mean, I think, you know, as I've said, what the, probably the most um, bittersweet response was someone in their mid 70s saying they were glad to be in their mid 70s um, because they, <laughs> they just really couldn't see any way out of this. Um, too much younger people, uh, families just arguing that education. Um, really, the notion has to be a kind of circular approach that that's, this has to be built in, not bolted on. So we kind of used the concept quite loosely. Um, as I said, we tried to use it in its strict sense. And you know, we had lovely rooms and free coffees and found it very difficult. You know, strange enough, people don't want to spend an hour and a half of their Friday talking to academics. Um, who, who knew? Um, but once we had a more uh, dynamic approach and went out into the community, people came to us to talk about it, which was great. Um, again, it's a very tight, very small scale research, but we want to then expand it into looking at what the wider networks are, but it was very interesting to do. Thank you very much. That's that's really excellent. Um, I have I have some additional questions that perhaps we can kind of uh, share that by email or sure. later on, um, just for the sake of time. I guess we should move on um, to the third uh, presentation, which I think is I think is mine and BJ's, right? Yes. Okay. So um, yeah, I'll talk. Uh, BJ, um, I'll, I'll just mention really briefly kind of the, the framework and then maybe if you talk about the case study, a um, couple minutes, if that's okay with you. Okay, thank you, Bobby. Okay, All um, right. okay. namaste to everyone. Uh, here is a good evening, so probably there's the afternoon there. Okay, uh, uh, I'd like to introduce about this, uh, in our case, about this um, uh, informal settlements, which is uh, often referred in a local term as Sukumbasi. Uh, it is one of the informal settlement that is Monora uh, with a household of uh, uh, approximately 400 and it's, an, uh, uh, it's a settlement in the embankment of the, one of the uh, river in Kathmandu Valley, Monora. So people have started to move in in this area uh, or you can say have enclosed the land there since, uh, since 2280 and uh, the area is not supposed to be a uh, infra uh, infrastructure serviced or it's a residential area and so they are uh, the area is of uh, high risk of flooding uh, disease and also the uh, state uh, state eviction notices uh, so in our cases we have uh, uh, we have tried to illustrate the co the the history of cooperation and struggle uh, struggle at three three different infrastructure sites that is like a shrine and a shrine uh, this uh, school and the electricity and in those infrastructure si sites uh, uh, we can see the the emergence of this collective actions the emergence of the communitarian values and also the uh, citizenship in those three infrastructure sites uh, i think we have a long video there so yeah back to you bobby Thanks, BJ. I'm just conscious that we have about 11 minutes to go, and I don't know how strict DSA will be in terms of the timing. So um, perhaps if there are any questions for BJ and I, if you could throw them into the chat, and we can kind of collectively take those questions along with questions for Xu Wen um, at the end, if that's okay with everyone. And um, if I could then just invite Xu Wen to present on, um, on her paper, does community duty planner open up room for maneuver for substantial Community participation in urban renewal. Um, please, uh, the floor is yours. And we'll have some questions at the end for everyone. Okay, thank you, Bobby. Um, yeah, so uh, my research is, um, as the title have told, uh, have told um, I'm focusing on the role of the planners and what, what they can do, um, what, what kind of role they can play to expand the room for maneuver for substantial like uh, citizen participation. So this general background in my research is like uh, in China in the past, uh, like almost 10 years, uh, the fast speed of urban renewal. And especially in the last five years, I would say things like 2015, 16, something uh, like that, as uh, smart urbanism become or uh, also become a key thing, which is like embedded in the urban renewal. Um, so at the same time, um, uh, uh, 
because like the very complicated stakeholder and ownership uh, in the, uh, the, 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 the old urban area. So the government realized the necessity to have public participation in that. And so a new mechanism called a duty planner, uh, like community duty planner mechanism uh, started to be experimented in Beijing, Shanghai and, and Chengdu, like a couple of big cities. Uh, so uh, in this process, and I observed a case um, which is in Beijing and it's called Shangjing neighborhood. Uh, so there is a group of uh, com community duty planners who are featured as like uh, big data uh, based, I, I, I call in my papers like uh, community e-planners. Um, so uh, I was observing like what they did and in the process of urban renew, especially, especially the renew of uh, public space uh in the uh neighborhoods uh especially the uh re residential compounds uh in this uh in, in beijing in big cities in, like, like in china uh so um i try to apply the framework of uh, the uh, the fabulous uh, uh the, the production of space and to see uh the relation well the, in general the, the political e economy uh, at, at the macro scale, scale and was relation, the social relation has been changing in China in the past uh, like 20, 30 years after 1998, uh, the housing reform. Um, and, and what happened in the communities, uh, what does community mean and uh, whether the community is still there or not. And, and then I saw uh, how this uh, community duty planners, they, they start a process uh, through um, like uh, applying the concept of pub, uh, public participation and also like the technology, uh, which on the one hand uh, empowered uh, the planners that those community plans themselves in from the government, uh, also like um, give them more power uh, to negotiate with the government to uh, to embed more substantial public participation in the entire process. Um, and while they were doing that, uh, I also saw that um, the communities were kind of rebuilt uh, in this process. Um, so some of the, uh, in, in, in this case, that uh, the, the tale that I, I told, uh, um, the, the rebirth of the, the, the well number six. So in this case, I saw uh, the, the, the people that, uh, in the community, uh, the first they were, the, the, the concept of the community like rebuilt by the duty planners uh, at the same time and uh, they also start started their own action and to um to also like do like fundraising for for instance to change uh, the public space in the community so um so that's the uh, the general uh, uh, content or uh, uh, my research about yeah so that's uh, so what do I teach this? Thank you, thank you, Shu, and thanks for keeping that uh, to time as well. So we have a couple of questions. Um, I think Richard and and Noom, I'm not sure who had their hand up first, but whoever would like to go. Uh, Richard first. Oh, okay. Well, I, actually, there's a question from John, which uh, is kind of similar to one of the things I was really interested in learning a bit more about, because it, it appears uh, Shu Wen from your case that the CDPs are kind of playing a brokering role between the communities and the government. And it's, it's kind of interesting, particularly with the, the, the type of data, the type of knowledge and the technologies. But there's a line in your uh, talk about the rights of the city cannot be realized without people being empowered with knowledge. And I, I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about that and perhaps also how that kind of knowledge can shape reshape sort of the city and the relationships with the state. Thank you. And yes, uh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, the question, I think I, I put the question like out of the theoretical framework in, in, in that page, um, because uh, there's criticism that, um, so when people, or when, when we apply uh, the theory of Lefebvre, uh, there's a criticism that it's, it's may not uh, a good theor theoretical framework to apply because in Lefebvre's theory, basically he's strongly against uh, like planners. Uh, so I think that uh, th that theory was built at that specific context. And also at that time, uh, we don't have, uh, well, at that time in 1960s and 70s in, in, in France, I probably don't have like the community planners, which 
kind of uh, emerge more also in planning theories, like uh, something uh, uh, more started in 1970s and 1980s when we have the discussion of pu 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 public participation. Uh, so that, that is basically the context of that. So uh, I, 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 I wrote this sentence uh, in the sense that um, uh, the people in the community uh, at the beginning, when there was like there, there's no community, they, they, when they are not organized, the knowledge was kind of dispersed. So they are, they are not like they're only like the experience. It's not start, uh, it hasn't been generated a, like in, in in the form of knowledge. So in this way, uh, my argument was um, that the, the we, we need certain form of planners, like the community planners. They might be the professionals, which is criticized in the Fabulous theory. Um, but they are uh, in today's time and when there's diversification of the type of planners and we also need this, this type of community planners, they are professional, but they also like closely work with the community people and generate uh, knowledge. So this is, uh, and, and this is also what observed in the process uh, when they are building up the community and in the process of the, the, the entire uh, design process and also like implementation as we're seeing in the case. Yeah. Great, thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you, Shun. That's very true. Um, Noom, did you have a question as well? Oh, yes. Um, Thank you, uh, Shuan, for, for sharing your study with us. Um, I think I'm kind of, Building up from Rich's questions, and I'm wondering our first question is if you can uh, elaborate a little bit more on the uh, technology used by the community duty planners uh, in relation to uh, the uh, public participation advocacy. Mm. Uh, and the second question is uh, I'm, I'm wondering in case of there are kind of contestations around uh, multiple stakeholders um, and how, how uh, this mechanism play, play a role and how, how they kind of um, manage conflicts and contestations in, in this situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so just one question, the mechanism you mean is the community duty plan and mechanism. Right. Mm -hmm. um, oh. The first question is more about the, the technology. That, yes, yes, that and the this second one. Is it's, it's about- Or, or the technology. Or, or so, so, okay, so both of the questions was about uh, technology, right? Um, uh, the, the second question is more about, about power struggling. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, between between con uh, conflicts and contestation. Yeah, I understand. Uh, so thank you for uh, first. Thank you for the question. So uh, I, I must start from the first question. So the technology that they use in this case. Well, this is a um, kind of mega program or project. I would say in this case. So it spent like two years, and it's one. Uh, it was also awarded by the UN Habitat as the the pilot, uh, UN Habitat pilot. So there's quite lots of um, like complement. Uh, sorry, like components in this project and also in terms of technology there are quite a lot of things they they did so uh so uh i i might just focus on the process that how they did um when they were doing like the urban renew, the, the the the, the renewal of the public space uh so uh, uh at the beginning i mean when, before they started the, the entire process that uh, the community planners they do uh, the land survey or the field work so they they, they survey the site uh, uh, in this process, they would use some cameras uh, installed by the government at the street corner and to analyze uh, some of the, the, the population flow and so on, so on. And also they use uh, the environmental sensor, which I also put in my slide. Uh, so it, this is like a tiny sensor, like, like people can also hold it. So they will hold this sensor, walk around this compound and to, to detect uh, noise or like bad smells and so on. So to, to, to collect this data. So after this step, they would integrate all this uh, information uh, into uh, well, basically it's kind of background research uh, for their design. Um, and the, the next step is they would have a preliminary design uh, for the site. And then they go to uh, the residence meeting 
uh, to show like the, pre the, the, the preliminary design and also the justification and the rationality and also kind of scientific rationality behind it. That's basically the data already collected. Uh, so they, 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 would, like, the, they use this information to communicate with uh, the residents. Uh, and then people will respond to that and they might agree with the data survey or not, uh, uh, or they, they might add a bit more of their experience and to discuss on um, the next step, how this design should be refined. And they will tell like, uh, uh, so, uh, so in this case, I also put in my slides that they initially, they, they think it's not, not necessary to renew the public space in general. They just want to remove a garbage collection site. Um, so, uh, but the project has existed before everything started because uh, the like, government had funding at that time to renew that place. So, uh, uh, so after like several rounds of discussion and in the process of, uh, of implementation, and eventually, like uh, the community duty planners, they think that's also people's needs. So, uh, for the garbage can. And uh, so they installed another environmental sensor onto uh, on the site of well, basically above the coverage can. Um, so with uh, this in, uh, this sensor installed, uh, the the residents like they also can see the data, uh, the visualize the data, and uh, what uh, well whether the smell of the garbage around this garbage and uh, whether the garbage was collected on time, and if not. Uh, they will report to through like the one, two, three, four, five hotline, which is a mayor hotline uh, designed by the Beijing municipal government to collect all the complaint from the residents uh, of the citizens and to uh, and to allocate this problem to the neighborhood government to in, to enforce them to address the problem. So this is like uh, how well the, the key the. the the, the major technology they used in this process. And I also argue that uh, this small sensor is very tiny, but this changed the kind of relation between the uh, residents and the government. So in the past, that they were quite, the residents, they were quite passive and they can do nothing with that or they, they might complain to the government, but um, uh, like the government may, may think that they are emotional and the problem cannot be easily addressed. But with the data, it's kind of also empower the residents that they can use the data as like evidence. It's basically the kind of evidence-based complaint to the government and to make government to take this problem more, more seriously and to address the issue. And so in terms of the cost, like, like contestation and, and stakeholder in this process, well, uh, in this case, I, I identify this um, a very interesting role that um, uh, it attracted actually lots of uh, other people outside with the government and also inside the government to help this site uh, to be renewed. And because the funding issues this site, uh, the renew of the well number six, it's not that well fluent. It's like in the process, a lot of obstacles like comes up and downs. And uh, so there's several times that they all they almost think this project will not be implemented anymore. Uh, so uh, the, the the community duty planners, the CEO of Urban XYZ, which was one of the uh, planners, um, they made lots of public talks and those public talks, they have very strong elements of technology and so on. And when I was talking with one of the key stakeholders, that's Beijing TV. Uh, so Beijing TV was documenting the, the entire process because um, they need to make a program called I Am Planners, which is commissioned by the planning bureau, uh, like Beijing Planning Bureau. And so, so they have got this project approved. And so they, 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 they cannot allow this project to, to stop in the middle. They have to finish documentation. And they select this case because uh, they think this, uh, this case have very strong elements of technology. So they also become a lobbyist in, for this project. And so, uh, so this makes things just becomes very interesting in the case that the technology, it's, well, it addresses problem uh, some problem, but in the in the meantime, it becomes a symbol uh, that's kind of caught a uh, lots of people to to work together to make things happen. 
uh, so like this is some interesting observation in, in, in this case, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shuin. Um, Thank you very much. I'm just conscious of time and I don't want to eat into everyone's lunch. Um, uh, no pun intended. Um, I'll just uh, respond to the question that John uh, and uh, Katrina, you, uh, you posed very, very quickly, if I may. So John asked the question, um, could you say a little bit more about how the research reforms efforts towards community involvement and planning? So I should just say really briefly that the, the kind of framework that we use for, um, for our paper is a recognition justice framework, which essentially uh, very crudely looks and explores um, the underlying norms, values, subjectivities, identities, so forth, um, and, and their value in, um, in uh, bringing about uh, social justice or environmental justice and alleviating marginalization. So that these kind of factors need to be considered. Um, as part of that, in the paper, we take kind of a plural approach looking at recognition through three different kind of types of recognition. So one we call communi uh, communicative recognition. So the way in which people kind of deliberate amongst each other and form consensus. The second is kind of a Foucauldian understanding of recognition that takes a governmental lens. It looks at the, the kind of uh, governmental categories, the ways in which the state classifies a population as being the basis for uh, recognition. And then lastly, this idea of struggle um, at, through infrastructure as being an aspect of recognition. And we link this, and this kind of relates to your question, Katrine, it, we, we link this to three different infrastructure sites that we argue embody or have a tendency towards one type of recognition. So the shrine embodies a form of kind of collective recognition in which people kind of communicate and come to a consensus around um, a particular uh, cultural understandings around protecting the shrine. The school becomes a kind of a embodiment of governmental recognition. Um, and then the last infrastructure, which is electricity, comes to embody struggles over infrastructure and kind of a citizenship politics. So that's kind of crudely put um, our approach, but we find that taking a plural approach to recognition has value because it allows us to see different ways in which a community might be able to intervene in terms of, uh, in terms of participation in their own context. Um, I'll leave it at that because we're, we're, we're over time, but um, I don't know if John and Richard, you'd like to add any kind of final thoughts at this stage. Um, otherwise, thank you very much, everyone. I'll need to invite people to come and join us for the next two sessions because, yeah. as I just said in a comment to, to Xu Wen, but I think it applies to everybody, there's, there's real resonances with the themes and topics that are emerging over the course of the next two sessions that we've got this afternoon. So please do, do come along because I think uh, taking together the three panels are going to be um, a, an interesting conversation around issues of, of participation, political space, uh, and, and the role of knowledge in, uh, in planning. So um, look forward to seeing you all at, I believe, one o'clock for- One o'clock, yeah. 24B. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you later. Thank you.